Alpha Phi family, hey, come on, let's stand to our feet. Listen, here's what we believe, that if we have breath, we have a reason to give God praise, amen? Come on, would you lift a shout of praise today? Every breath belongs to you, oh God. I'll praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, and I'll praise when I'm doubting. I wasn't made to be 
that we were made for so much more. And here's the deal today, God, we don't put our trust in who we are, but we put our trust in who you are. That on our own, we are not enough, but with you, you are more than able and you are more than enough. And so today, I don't know how you walked in these doors. I don't know what you're facing, but what I want to encourage you today is I want to encourage you to get your eyes off of yourself and off of your situation. Because God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so today, I don't know what you're facing, but maybe we could just take a step back and sing an old song that some of us will remember that will remind us of who our God is. And for one moment, get your eyes off the situation and start to believe in who he is again. We sing praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress, He's my deliverer, in Him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. We trust the name.
lifted high all over this place today. We declare you are more than All of the faith in the room, what the Lord can do, what the Lord can do, and it's gonna happen. So just let the way make it through. He's gonna move, he's gonna move. Can we sing it to you? Can you, can you imagine with all of the faith in the room, what the Lord can do? Oh, what the Lord can do. Come on, can you sing it out? It's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. Just let the way make us through. He's gonna move. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? With all of the faith in the room, what the Lord can do. Yeah. What the Lord can do. Yeah. It's gonna happen. So just let the way. And here's what we believe today. Here's what we believe today. That we see the impossible thing in front of us, but then we look up and we see the God of the impossible above us. And can I, can I take it one step further for you today? I want you to close your eyes and I want you to picture that impossible thing. For some of you, it says marital infidelity. For some of you, it says a physical diagnosis. For some of you, it says financial lack. For some of you, it says addiction. For some of you, it says mental health. For some of you, it says that you are broken beyond repair. But you look up and you see a God who is more than able. And when you look up, listen, listen, listen. When you look up, he says, look in. Because I am in you, I am working through you, I am fighting for you, I am with you. Come on, if you need a spark in your life today, would you lift a shout of praise and faith like God is in you, like he is working through you, like his spirit is alive in you, like it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. In Jesus' name we declare, everybody shouted with faith in their hearts today, amen. Amen. You may be seated. We serve a good and a faithful God, and we serve a God who is not just the God above us, but through the person of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, he is the God who has chosen to make his home within us, and that is a beautiful thing. Wherever you go, God goes with you. In that impossible situation, you're walking in his presence into that room, into that meeting, into that conflict. He is with you you. Amen. Hey, listen, we're so glad that you came to church today. Is anybody else glad that you're in church this morning? If it's your first time, whether you're in person or online, listen, here's what we know. It's not an accident that you're here. Psalm 139, 16 says very, very clearly that God ordained this moment for you because he loves you so much. And we're thankful that you're with us. And we are so pumped to have you. And we're going to see if we can fix this right now, that sound. But anyways, uh, I'm going to move on. My sound guy brain went in another direction, but I'm back with you right now. Hey, listen, we are so, so thankful for what God's doing here at our church. And we're so thankful that you chose to be a part of it. And here's what I love about our church. We had an amazing Easter Sunday last weekend. But we're not just 
a local church, we're a regional church, and we're not just a regional church, we are a global church reaching this world for Jesus. In fact, Pastor Don and Pastor Jessamy are in India right now, ministering to multiple hundreds, actually over a thousand pastors who will then disperse the gospel to others as well. And they recorded a video for you they'd like to show you. There's two videos, first them, and then another update from the team in India. You can turn your attentions to the screen right now to see that. Tree of Life, we had an incredible Easter weekend, starting off with our Good Friday service, then of course our special needs egg hunt, and then with our Sunday morning service, we had over 2,600 in attendance. We had 70 water baptisms and over 125 salvation. Absolutely incredible. Who would have thought but God? And we picked an outdoor service. We really felt the Lord said, so we're trusting him along the way. But I got to be honest, I was a bit nervous. Would anybody come out? And you came out in great numbers, even backing the traffic up on I-35 that we delayed to start 15 minutes to be able to get everybody in. Thank you, Tree of Life. What a great time we had. Also, we had an amazing event happening in Nepal. Yeah, over Easter weekend, uh, several churches, several organizations across the country came together for an Easter celebration, over 90,000 people. And Tree of Life Nepal, 37 churches participated with around 3,000 volunteers to make it an amazing event in Nepal. God's moving and working there. Don't forget, today is Mission Sunday, so you're going to want to make sure that you grab some breakfast or lunch in the cafe, grab a coffee, or also you can give at our drop-down menu online. Yeah, and you know, all the proceeds go to missions, and in particular, since we're in India and Nepal, we're doing pastors and leaders conferences with probably over 1,500, 12 to 1,500 pastors and leaders in India and Nepal, and you're going to make it possible through your generosity. And keep us in your prayers. We're going to miss you guys these next few weeks, but we'll send updates, and we can't wait till we get back together again. But thank you so much for being a tree of life to a lost and hurting world. Amen, amen. Hey, aren't you glad to be a part of a church that is reaching the world for Jesus? Amen. Here's what I want to do for just a moment, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but I want us to pray for Pastor Don, Pastor Jessamy, and some of our team who are over there or are on their way right now. Can we do that together? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for a church who uh, has always believed the original founding vision of this church. There were seeds that would be spread along the wind as Pastor Don Sr. saw it when God gave him the vision for this place. And those seeds would be spread to different parts of the earth and churches would be planted and different trees would come up. Father, I thank you that there are churches being planted all over India and churches being planted all over Nepal as a result of the vision that you gave for this place 40 plus years ago. And we are so humbled and privileged to be a part of it. We wanna say thank you that you would use us, our generosity, our prayers to impact the nations for Christ. That's what we wanna be, a tree of life to a lost and hurting world. Father, we pray your protection and safety according to Psalm 91 over our pastors. Father, we thank you that as they're there, your hand is on them, that your angels are protecting them and watching them, that you are directing and establishing their paths according to Proverbs 16 and Psalm 37. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that even the food that they eat is blessed, that their bodies are healthy and whole according to 1 Peter 2.24. But Father, we thank you. I know the enemy will be frustrated because of the offensive that is coming against his kingdom right now, but we declare and speak that Jesus said, on this rock he would build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And we'll storm the gates of hell and we'll take back the people that the enemy thought he was taking to hell. In Jesus' name we declare, your vision for this church will come to pass. Our pastors will do what you've called them to do. Divine connections and many people receiving Jesus as a result of the multiplied ministry of our pastors ministering to pastors in that area. In Jesus' name everyone said, amen. Hey, listen, I wanna tell you really quick, today is Mission Sunday, as you saw on there. And I'm just gonna say this, and I'm gonna say it hopefully to build faith for you, but my family and I, we commit every month, we give financially towards what God is doing in India. And if I could just say this, we've done it when the money's been up, and we've done it when the money's been way down before. But God has taken care of us every single time 
as long as we've trusted him and taken care of his kingdom and his people. I don't know where your finances are at today, but I do know where God's finances are. And if you will trust him, and if you will take care of other people, I promise you, according to Matthew 6, and Malachi 3, 10, you can look it up for yourself, he will take care of you and supply all of your needs. So today, if you'd like to give to missions above and beyond your regular tithe and offering, I wanna encourage you to do that. This is where we practice generosity as a local church, to be a tree of life to a lost and hurting world. You may not be able to travel to these places, but you can give generously and you can pray fervently and God will move in that way and it will be credited to you in heaven when these people receive Jesus. So if you'd like to give, there's a few ways you can do that. Number one is online at treeoflifechurch.org slash give. You can give via the mobile app as well. Search in your app store for Tree of Life Church NB. If you wanna do missions, just designate that. You'll see some drop down menus. Um, you can also uh, set your giving to recurring, which is super cool. You can give via text. Text the word give and the dollar amount to the number that you see on screen. If you want to give to missions, text the word missions and the dollar amount to that number. And then finally, if you want to give via envelope, there are envelopes in the seat backs in front of you. Hang on to those to the end of service. Drop them in the black boxes as you exit. And one more thing, today we are going to do communion together as a family at the end of service. So there are communion elements in the seat back in front of you. There's a little rack right there. If you're in the front row, it's in a basket. But listen, if you're at home, I want you to do this for me. I want you to take this moment, go grab something that you can use as a communion element. It doesn't exactly matter what it is, it's what it represents. You may not have bread and juice like we do, but you grab something and God will see your heart in it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness. We thank you that we can trust you in every single way. And Father, we give generously knowing that we are called to be a blessing to others. And when we do that, you will always provide. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, listen, God has so much more in store for you. But before we move on, let's check out some announcements on Tree TV. And welcome to Tree of Life Church. We're so glad you've joined us today. If you'd like more information about Tree, or if you have a prayer request, fill out our Connect card online or from the seat back in front of you. Here at Tree, we have an amazing experience for your kids. We provide fun, safe, and age-appropriate classes during both our 9 and 11 a.m. services for newborns all the way to middle schoolers. We also have Life Night for middle and high school students that meets every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. where students get to hang out together and encounter our living God. For for all you young adults 18 to 30, we meet every Sunday after second service in room 202 for Rooted. And we have a special service at 5 p.m. the first Sunday of the month. We have some great classes on Sunday mornings designed to build community and help strengthen your relationship with God, like our Next Steps class that starts next Sunday, April 14th. In this three-week class, you'll discover the amazing plan God has for you and your life and the next steps that you can take to help connect you with that plan. You'll also learn to identify and grow the spiritual discipline in your life that impact your relationship with God. I'm Matt. I'm Haley. And we're out at the Special Olympics Cycling Competition of 2024, out timing the racers. Cheering on all the amazing participants at our welcome tent, handing out food, snacks, and just having a great time. So we just want to thank everyone that showed up to participate and help serve. And thank you for being a tree of life to a lost and hurting world. Thank you, tree of life. You're awesome for letting us do this at your guys' area. Every month, we partner with the New Braunfels Food Bank to help provide food for people in need. This Thursday, April 11th, we'll meet in the parking lot to pack up and deliver food as part of our food home delivery program. And next Thursday, April 18th, we'll host a food distribution right here on campus. These are great opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our area, so consider serving. It's all part of being a tree of life to a lost and hurting world. Our next gen family fishing day is this Saturday, April 13th at the Tree of Life Pond. We'll provide everything you need from fishing poles to tackle. All you need to do is bring the whole family out at 10 a.m. and enjoy the fun. On Friday, April 19th, we're hosting a married's night in the main auditorium from 7 to 8.30 p.m. It's gonna be a great night finding out how well you know your 
your spouse and how well you communicate. We'll enjoy some sweets, some coffee, and of course, some great fellowship. Childcare is free, but space is limited, so sign up on our website. If you're interested in learning more about our classes, events, volunteer opportunities, or just more about Tree of Life Church, make sure you visit our website, download our app, or stop by the Connect Center in the main lobby. All right, God has a message just for you this morning, so let's get ready to receive his word. Well, good morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. So amazing to see all of you out here today. If this is your first time, we want to welcome you. Um, I am not our senior pastor. I am uh, Pastor Dave. I am the next gen and young adults pastor here uh, at Tree of Life. Um, our pastors are uh, away for a few weeks. They're uh, in several different countries doing ministry. Um, pastor Don has an amazing opportunity to preach to about 300 pastors. 300 pastors and train, um, and that's what our church is called to do. That's what pastor believes that our church is called to do. We're called to train, we're called to equip, um, and they get to do that in another country. Let's take a moment and let's pray for them one more time. Father, we thank you for our senior pastors. They are a gift that you have given to our church. And God, we pray for your, your anointing upon them. We pray for your protection around them, Father. We pray that every place that they go, God, your presence will follow them. Your presence would go before them and it will prepare the way. God, I pray that every time Pastor Don and Pastor Jessamy speak, Father, it is full of your anointing and full of power and that lives are changed as a result. God, we thank you again for a shield of protection around them as they sleep, that you give them rest and that you give them courage and boldness to keep proclaiming the good news and keep fulfilling the mission that you have placed on their lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said Amen, amen. Again, thank you for being here. We've got, uh, at the end of the service, we're going to take communion. So if you're watching online, as Pastor Cody said, um, go ahead and get your elements on and be prepared uh, for that. Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday was amazing. Amazing. And you saw on the video, we had over 2,600 people and we had over 125 salvations and 70 people uh, baptized. And those are great, but... I just want to give it up for our amazing all-stars. Can you clap for our leaders and every person that sacrificed for that week? And you saw the Sunday morning, especially for the worship team because I was a part of that team. You saw the Sunday morning, but we were here every single night rehearsing, literally, from Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. We had prayer Wednesday, Thursday, and then we had service Friday, and then Saturday we were back out here again. But all of that to create... Uh, the environment that we saw on Sunday. So for all of the, the greeters and the ushers and the first contact stepping in and, and trying to direct traffic, and some of you were bagged up on the highway <laughs> and uh, helping to get all of that facilitated. But then to, I, I believe, one of the, the most important teams, if you will, if we could deem someone important, I want to give it up for our production team. Can you clap for them? Amazing. Because as many hours as we put in, they put in a lot of time as well for that amazing service. And for all of the 2,600 people that were there, but there were also hundreds and hundreds of people that watched online and they made that possible. So thank you, production team. Um, and then I want to give a couple quick announcements. This uh, tonight at 5 p.m., 5 p.m. back in our TSM auditorium. If you are from the ages of 18 to 30, um, for our young adult service, come on out. We've got a message. We have uh, some worship and uh, just hang out a little bit. And every first Sunday uh, of the month at 5 p.m., we're in the back. And then next Saturday, the 13th, our next gen family fishing uh, day is at 10 a.m. So if you want to be a part of a part of that as well, come on out. You can stop by uh, the Welcome Center and get some information on that as well. And then the following Friday, if you are a married couple. We have our tree married tonight um, from 7 to 8.30 out in our main lobby. And so come out and be a part of that as, as well. All right, y'all ready for the word? Yeah. Amen. Let's pray one more time. Father, thank you. Your presence is here, Father. I decrease so that you can increase. God, I pray that this message that you're going to speak to our hearts today, Father, that it would change our lives that would change the course, the direction of our lives, and that you would give us the strength that we need to continue to hope again. God, that you would allow us to be changed forever. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. 
Last week, if you were here for our Easter service, Pastor Don kicked off, uh, well, he didn't kick off uh, a series, but he preached a message called Alive in Him. Alive in Him. Wasn't that an amazing message? Amazing. And then he gave this illustration uh, of the bins. Remember the bins? And he showed the bins and he showed how Christ is on the inside of us and we're on the inside of Christ and then and all we're on the inside of God. And he used a scripture in Colossians chapter 3 that says that my life is now hidden in Christ, in God. So I'm alive in him. And so over the next couple of weeks, Pastor Cody and I are going to be talking to you all about what does it look like to be in him? What do we have for being in him? And we talk about the, the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. But with his resurrection, along with his resurrection, we received something. What does that look like? And so, again, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about that. And after the resurrection, now what? After salvation, now what? What do, I, what do I have? What do I do after all of this? And we could go weeks and weeks and talk about all of the different things that we have in him. And how we have peace in him and we have joy in him and how we have healing in him and freedom in him and how we have uh, 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 strength in him and power in him, all of those different things. We could talk weeks and weeks and weeks about what we have in him. And I encourage you that though we may not exhaust the subject, you can still study to show yourself approved unto God. Start looking into finding out what you possess in him. Because what we believe is we believe if, if, if we're going to live the life that is afforded to us by Christ, we have to know what belongs to us in him. Things we have in Christ, what we possess, the authority, the dominion that we have, we don't have it because he died. We have it because he rose. We don't have healing because Christ died. Our healing be comes because he got up. We don't have joy and peace and strength and the anointing of God upon us because he died. We have it because he got up. And if Jesus hadn't risen, there wouldn't be any answer for the sin problem that Adam created. We wouldn't have an answer to that if Jesus hadn't got up. There would be no healing. There would be no freedom. There would be no power if Jesus had not got up. So when he got up, he brought with us or brought us something. What I want to begin this series talking about today is hope in him. We have hope in him. The resurrection of Jesus was the greatest promise of hope beyond the grave. It was the greatest promise that we had. And if he did not come back from the grave, we would not have any hope. And when we use that word hope, we often use it uh, in, in a verb tense. And we talk about, you know, a wish or a desire or, or, or something that this, this expectation that we have. And oftentimes it's an expectation that sometimes doesn't even happen. And it's like when you were growing up and Christmas time came around. And you wrote out, your, or wrote out your Christmas list. You got the Christmas list. Or it was your birthday. And you have all these things. You're just like, I hope I can get everything on my list. I hope I can get this for my birthday. And that's what it was when you were a kid. And then when you get older, it turns a little different. I hope I can pay this bill. <laughs> I hope when I swipe my card... The attendant doesn't get disrespectful and say, uh, excuse me, it's declined. It's like, why they got to get loud when it's declined? Can you, like, you know it's declined. Can you pull me to the side and say something? Don't embarrass me in front of everybody. I hope I get that promotion. I hope I get that house. I hope I get that car. I hope my credit score is good enough so that they will approve me for the loan. We use that word hope for a wish and for a desire. And I was looking in the dictionary on the definition of hope and I found this definition and I thought it was so good. 
And I put it in your notes, and I want you to look at this. And it's the, the noun tense of the word hope. And it says, someone on which hopes are centered. Now, if you notice, I didn't say something. That def definition didn't say a thing. It said someone on whom our hopes are centered. And for so long, we've been getting defeated because we've been putting our hope in things instead of the one who gives us the things. So for so long, we put our hope in the healing rather than in the healer. For so long, we've put our hope in the miracle rather than in the miracle worker. For so long, we put our hope in the deliverance that we're looking for, to God to give us rather than in the one who delivers. And so what I want and my hope and my prayer is by the end of this message, you no longer hope in things, but your hope lies in him. The reality is, is that sometimes when we hope in things, it doesn't happen. What happens if the healing doesn't come? What happens if you're trying to pay that bill and the car still gets repoed? What happens when you go get behind on the mortgage and you've been praying and you've been believing and you've been fasting and you've been doing all of the things that you learned in church and all of the stuff that we say, it's like you put this thing in and you get something out. What happens if it doesn't happen? What happens if you put all of your, your, your time and your energy into that relationship and then Paul doesn't put a ring on it? I'm sorry if your name is Paul in here. I just, that, that name just... <laughs> Somebody boyfriend named Paul sitting next to him, they like, see, he was talking to you. <laughs> if you like it, then you should have. No, nah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when it doesn't happen? And that's the reality. And sometimes we don't want to look at reality. Faith is not a denial of reality. Reality still exists. But what happens when it doesn't happen? I took my son to the doctor the other day, and we went uh, to get some x-rays. My son is uh, a basketball player, and he does, he's actually doing pretty, pretty good. And he takes after his father and just... <laughs> <laughs> and my son wants to be tall, because his dad is tall. And then he looks at his mother. <laughs> and she's 4'11". And she's like, no, I'm five foot. You better give me my inch. <laughs> and he's like, God, please don't let me take after my mother. <laughs> it is funny. If you see, if you see my, my wife, her mom, her grandma, her sister, they literally all of them are five feet. They just, it's like a straight line. <laughs> He's like, I hope that I can take after my dad. Please let me get my dad's height. And so they measured him. The doctor measured him. And we're sit, uh, sitting in the room before the doctor comes in. And I said, how do you feel, son? He's like, I'm kind of excited, but I'm also kind of nervous. And I said, so what if, it, what if they tell you you're not going to grow anymore? And he's like, dad, no, I'm not even thinking that way. I'm going to keep growing. I said, but what if they tell you that you're not? He said something to me. He said, Dad, you always want me to be ready for anything. I said, you're absolutely correct, son. I always want you to be prepared for anything. Now, I'm not telling you don't have faith. Still have faith, but be prepared for it. What if it doesn't happen? Then what? I didn't want him to place his faith in him growing anymore. I wanted him to place his faith in the one who can open the door if he does it. Now, when the x-rays came back, he was so excited because the doctor said, well, his growth plate is still open. and He'll at least get to about 6'1". I was like... I said, I done invested some money, son. You got to get to the pros because you owe me. 
<laughs> and I got receipts. <laughs> This is an investment, and I'm going to get an ROI. <laughs> so he was excited about it. He was excited that they told him that he was going to grow anymore. But I said, son, I didn't want you to just hope in the fact that you were going to get taller, but I wanted you to think about what's going to happen if you're not. Is your hope and your faith in the fact that you get taller because it looks better for scouts and, other, and those other things? Or can you hope in the one that if I don't get taller, my God still opens doors that no man can shut? That my God still has favor that goes out before me and it follows me and it surrounds me? Is my faith, is your hope in the one who can do it or is your hope in what he does? Is your hope in the result or the outcome? Or is your hope in the one who brings the results and the outcome to pass? You know, it takes a certain kind of faith to hope for something and it doesn't happen. It takes a certain kind of faith to fast and to pray and to stand on faith and to believe and stand on the promise of God and it doesn't happen. You know, it's kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they were believing and they told King Nebuchadnezzar, listen, you can throw us in the fire and we know that our God can deliver us, but even if he does not, we know that he's still able. It takes a certain kind of faith to say that if he doesn't show up, it doesn't mean he's not able. Now, I don't know why he didn't show up, but I do know that he's able. I don't know why he didn't close the door. I don't know why he didn't open the door. I don't know why he didn't provide. I don't know why the healing didn't come, but he's still a healer. Can you hope that way? Not in what he brings, but can you hope in him? That's where our Father wants our hope to be. You see, because when Jesus came, he didn't come to just bring us hope. He is our hope. He didn't come to just bring hope and this wish and this desire that I'm going to go to heaven one day. See, Jesus didn't even want you to come to heaven. He said, Father, I don't want you to remove them from this world, but I want you to protect them from the evil one. And see, we're trying to get to heaven, and Jesus said, no, I want to create heaven right here. I've given you the power and the authority. That's why he said, your kingdom come, your will be done right here on earth like it is in heaven. He doesn't want us to come there. He wants us to create heaven right here. But our hope's got to be in the right place. Our hope's got to be in him. Paul said it like this in his letter to Timothy when he opened up his letter in 1 Timothy 1. It said, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, look at this, our hope. My hope and my prayer is that you and I can get to a place of not hoping in things, but hoping in him. And I'm not preaching a message to you that I'm not living out myself because can I tell you, I've got to remind myself that my hope is in him. I've got to remind myself that it's not the things that I'm seeking after, but it's him. He said, listen, in Matthew 6, he says, if you seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, he said, the things that you're hoping for, the things that you're needing, listen, I'll give them to you, but I just want you to put your hope in me. If we're going to see victory in our lives. If we're going to see victory in our marriages, we have to change the object of our hope. When we place our hope in things, and we don't get it, it messes us up. It messes your mind up. When you've got a, a loved one on a hospital bed, and you pray for them, and you pray for God's healing to come, and it doesn't happen, and they still go home to be with the Lord. You begin to ask yourself, God, I prayed, why? I believed, why didn't it happen? I, I said by your stripes we are healed, why didn't, it, why didn't it happen? One day we'll find out the answer to those questions. But can you have that kind of faith and that hope like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego if it doesn't happen? My hope still lies 
in him. You ever hope for something so bad and you didn't get it? How'd you feel? Didn't feel good, did it? You know, scripture says this in Proverbs chapter 13. It says it this way. It says, hope deferred makes the heart, what? Sick. It don't feel good when you're hoping for something and it's delayed. Your friends got married in their 20s. And now you're in your mid to late 30s, early 40s, and you're still not married yet. Hope deferred can make the heart sick. Now, I don't have no answers to that. There's a paw in here somewhere. (laughs) But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Now, don't go take that scripture and say, look, I found the scripture where the church was founded on. That's not it. (laughs) Just because it say tree of life don't mean that it was from. (laughs) My hope is not in a thing. But my hope Your hope should be in him. You see, people hope for things. They hope that their job is always going to be there. They hope that their job is going to always have the money to pay their salary. They hope in their job as a source. We sometimes, and I'm guilty of this sometimes, will hope in my own strength and my own abilities. Listen, if I don't have it, I'm a hustler. I grew up as a hustler. I can go out and hustle. I can make some money. Now, it was an illegal way when I was growing up. (laughs) But I know how to do it the legal way now. (laughs) I can go out and make some money. And see, we put our hope in our own strength and in our own abilities instead of putting our hope in him. Listen, you don't have that wealth. You don't have that good job, that promotion. You don't have that business because you're just so good. You have it because of Deuteronomy 8.18. It's him who gave you the power to get wealth. You didn't do it by yourself. He gave you that power. He gave you that wisdom. He gave you that strength. He gave you that witty idea. He gave it to you. So where does your hope lie? What happens if they pass pink slips out to everybody? Is your hope in the job or is your hope in him? See, often we put our hope in God's provision rather than in God, our provider. Somebody missed that. We hope in the provision and him supplying our need rather than in him being the provider. See, Paul said it this way in Philippians 4. He says, my God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory. It's not the needs or it's not the things that I'm I'm hoping in him meeting the need. No, I'm hoping in him and his ability to do it. That even if he doesn't, I still hope in him. It's kind of like what happened in John chapter 6. After Jesus feeds the 5,000. He goes off by himself, and they come back, and they find him, and they're following him, and Jesus turns to him. He says, listen, you're not following me just because I am who I am. You're following me because I gave you a fish dinner. That's why you're following me, and I'm paraphrasing. They said, well, Jesus, what you want us to do? What you expect? You fed us. We was hungry, and you fed us. What you expect? He said, believe in the one who sent me. Believe in in me. Don't believe in the provision. Believe in me. Don't believe in the miracle. Believe in me. Don't believe in the deliverance. Believe in me. God wants us to get to a place where our hope is not in things, but our hope is in him. Some of you got too much hope in your savings account. I know that stung a little bit to somebody, Philip. Not you, it wasn't you, I just looked at you. (laughs) Now, by no means am I telling you to not have a savings account because it's wisdom to do that. But is your hope in your cushion? Or is your hope in the Father who provided the cushion that you got anyway? Is your hope in your financial portfolio and how you diversify all of your finances and you invest over here and you got stocks over there and you got money that's, that you got that money that's just making while you sleep? Like some of y'all, like I, I envy some of you, you making that money while you sleep. 
I don't envy you. That's, that's wrong. That's a sin. I don't do that. <laughs> but is your hope in your savings accounts and all of those other accounts that you got, the offshore accounts, if you got one of them? <laughs> don't say you do because you go tell on yourself if you got it. <laughs> Or is your hope in the provider? What happens if the banks shut down? What happens if all of that money you got, that cash you got stocked in your safe or in your mattress, if you still hide money in your mattresses or in the ceilings or in the walls or whatever, what happens if tomorrow the dollar loses its value? What happens if tomorrow you got, seven, you got seven figures, eight figures in your account today, and tomorrow it's wiped out, all the banks are gone, they have no idea where all the money is gone, and now it's zero. What happens then? Where is your hope? Is your hope in him, or is your hope in your cushion? God wants to be the object of our hope. Not what he does for us, but him himself. Not in our own strength and abilities, but in him. It says this in Psalm chapter 39. It says, show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere hand breadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. You put your hope in your five-year plan. Put your hope in your retirement plan and your retirement funds, your IRA. You might seem secure, but it's just a breath. Look at the next verse. In verse 6 it says, surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, uh uh-oh, heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. Money you're saving up, where is it going? Who is it going to be? Oh, I got a will. And I got my will, and if it goes away, if, I, if something happens to me, my kid's going to get this, what, what the government can say, well, we don't honor wills anymore. Now what? Verse 7, but now, Lord, what do I look for? Look at this. My hope is in you. Amen. See, when your hope is in him, you understand that it don't belong to you anyway. You understand that nothing you have belongs to you anyway. And if God says give it all away, a person whose hope in him, whose hope is in him, if he says give it all away, you'll be like, okay, God, I'm not thinking twice. It's a seed. I'm giving it. But if by chance he whispers, Pastor Dave, just make sure. (laughs) It's his voice. It's not the enemy. It's... (laughs) A person whose hope is in him. Doesn't matter what he says. I'm going to do exactly what he tells me to do. Well, Pastor Dave, he won't tell me to give away my finances. You sure? Because there was a man that came to Jesus and said, well, Jesus, how can I get eternal life? And he said, well, you got a whole lot. Why don't you sell it all and give it away and then come follow me? He said, no, I'm good, Jesus. I can't do that. You know the racks on racks I got, Jesus? And I can't. You see my bag, Jesus? I can't get rid of it. Jesus wanted to see where his hope lie. Is your hope in me or is your hope in the wealth that you created? You know, when we were growing up, the old church used to say it this way. He said, my hope is built in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He said, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. And then they said, on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. Don't put your hope in things. There's all other ground. It's sinking sand. God wants us to get to a place where our hope is in him. Not in what he does for us, but it's in him. And you might say, Pastor Dave, I'm tired. 
I've been praying, I've been believing, I've been hoping, and I've been holding on for so long. Can I give you some encouragement today? In Isaiah chapter 40, it says, do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Look at this. He will not grow tired or weary. You might have gotten tired, but God has not gotten tired. You might fall asleep, but he doesn't slumber or sleep. And his understanding, no one can fathom. Look at this. He gives strength to those that are weary. And he increases the power of the weak. Anybody need some strength today? Anybody need some power? He has promised us that he gives us this power when we're weary. He gives us this strength when we feel weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But look at this. Those who hope in the Lord, not in the things, but when your hope is in him, there's a strength that comes that no one else can give you. It's a strength that only comes from him. And watch this. It didn't say that he renews your strength. It says the one who hopes in him will renew their strength. Now, we know the strength comes from him, but there is something that we've got to do first, and it's hope in him. And there is a strength that comes that gives us the ability to soar on wings like eagles. It gives us the ability to run and not get weary that gives us the ability to walk and not faint when our hope is in him. Can I submit to you today that the reason that we're feeling weak is because our hope has been in the wrong place. The reason that we've been getting, reason we've been getting weary is because we've been placing our hope in things rather than our hope in him. Psalms chapter 33 says this, but the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. Look at this. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. I know that they're saying that the economy is on a downturn, but he keeps us alive in famine. I know that they're saying that we're probably going to hit another great depression. I don't trust in the government. My hope is in him who keeps me alive in a famine. So when everybody else doesn't have it, I know I'm going to have it. David said that a thousand might fall at my right side and 10,000 at my right hand, but it will not come near me. I will only observe it with my eyes. When your hope is in him and not in things, he says, when you put your hope in the Lord, he is your help. He is your shield. Verse 21, in in him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us. But our hope is in you alone. There is no one else that I'm going to place my hope in. My hope, God, is in you alone. In the beginning, I said that Jesus doesn't want to just bring you hope. But Jesus is your hope. Now I want to submit to you that God is not only your hope, but he does also want to bring you hope. In Jeremiah 29 and 11, we've got the scripture out there on the wall. It says, for I know the plans that I have for you. They're plans to prosper you. Their plans not to harm you. And I know people have said that God is out, that God is out to get you. God says, listen, that's not me. My plans are not to harm you. I know they may have said that you're struggling financially because of sin that you've done, because of things that you have done, because of times that you have met, you have uh, made mistakes. Listen, God says, my plan is to prosper you. That's my plan. I don't know what your plans are, but my plan is to prosper you. My plan is not to harm you. He says, my plans are to give you a hope and to give you a future. You know, it's easy for me to put my hope in someone whose desire is to give me hope. It's easy for me to trust in someone who I know has my best interests at heart. Put your hope in him. 
because all other ground is sinking sand. Now, before we go, there's a song that says this. Listen, I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. My hope and firm, he'll never sing it from your heart. Say, I put my faith, I put my faith in my anchor to the ground. My hope and firm foundation, hey, he'll never. One more time. Say, to you. from your heart. Great is your faithfulness from the rising sun to the setting same I will pray from the rising sun from the rising sun whether it's good or bad I will praise from the rising sun closed on the chance that there's someone in here and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior this is your moment this right here is your moment and what you're feeling right now is you're feeling the Holy Spirit drawing you why? because God promised us if we lift him up he would draw men to himself you feel the Holy Spirit drawing you to himself You've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior. You've never said yes to him. Can you lift your hand so that I can see it? You want to say yes today. I see that hand right there. I see that hand back there. I see that hand all the way in the back. I see that hand back there in the back. I see that hand over here. Yeah. Go ahead. Keep lifting them so we can see it. I see that hand over here on the side. I see that hand back there. Praise God. Yeah, I see that hand over there. Yeah, I see that hand right here in the front. I see that hand back there. Yeah, come on. Keep lifting them. We'll wait. We'll wait. Keep saying yes to him. Hallelujah. And if you're watching online, I want you to put a hand in the chat so we can see you there as well. Yeah, I see that hand that just went up back there. Praise God. You can put your hands down. And maybe you're here. You had your hope in him before. You started to walk away and you've begun to hope in yourself. You've been not begun to hope in things. You strayed away a little bit, but you're ready to come back and hope in him again. Listen, we call that recommitment, rededication. And if you want to do that today and recommit your life to him, can you lift your hands so that I can see it all over this room? Hands going up all over this room. Praise God. Yeah. 
can put your hands down and with every head still bowed and every eye still closed, we're going to say this very simple prayer. And I want you to mean it from your heart because that's where the power lies. And God's going to do something on the inside of you. It's not going to make you perfect. It's going to make you better. And every day you're going to strive to get better and better and better and better. Say, Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. On this day, I ask you into my heart. I ask you into my life. I ask you to be my Savior. And I ask you to be my Lord. Change me. Make me new. Make me more like you. In Jesus' name. Come on, can you clap for those that accepted Christ today? Yeah, I love it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's the greatest decision that you can ever make in your life. Listen, don't leave yet. You want to do one more thing as a family if you can take your seats. If you accepted Christ today, we want to do something together. Maybe it's the first time that you're ever going to do this. And I want to encourage you that as we take communion today, Jesus said, as often as you do it, I want you to remember me. As often as you take this communion, I want you to put your eyes and your focus on me. I told this story in first service, and with the few moments that I have left, there was a season in my wife and my, in, in my life when we were living in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we were part of this church, and our pastor at that time was teaching us about communion. And what she said was, she said, if you're looking for God to do a healing in your body, take communion. If you're needing God to do something in your heart, take communion. If you, you, you have unforgiveness in your heart, take communion. And that part hit me because I was holding on to some unforgiveness and it was hard to let it go. She said, take communion for seven days. Now, it may not be seven days for you. It may be two weeks or a month, but be committed to do this for seven days and watch what God does. And I tell you, on the first and the second day, I didn't feel any forgiveness. And on the third and the fourth day, I prayed and I asked God, I said, I'm putting this in your hands and I forgive that person and I didn't forgive, I didn't feel any forgiveness. But day five, I started to feel that it didn't sting like it did on day one. And on day six, I felt it stung a little bit less and I actually had this a little bit more peace in my heart. On day seven, I figured and found out that I was finally free of it. And what that was, it wasn't the elements per se, but it was a heart of intentionality and focus. How can you ask me for forgiveness whom you haven't seen? The person that you see every day that you can't forgive. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. And so taking communion made me focus on the sacrifice that Jesus made for me and how he forgave me for things that people knew about and for them things that nobody knew about. And it gave me the ability to forgive someone else. So as you take this body and as you take this cup, do it in remembrance of Jesus. His body was broken for you. It was bruised. He was broken and beaten just for you. And the amazing thing about it is if you were the only person left in this world, Jesus would do it all over again. Let's take the bread. And then the cup. It's a reminder of the blood that Jesus shed for us. It's like when Pastor Don gave that illustration, he said that our lives are hidden in Christ and God from Colossians 3, and he showed us those bins. This is what happens when Jesus now, when God now sees us. He doesn't see your sins anymore. He sees the blood. You're covered by the blood. So now when you stand before him, he sees you through the lens of the blood of Jesus. And his blood was perfect. You're not perfect. But like the Bible says, now unto him who is able to present us faultless. You're not faultless, but he presents you to the Father faultless. Every 
Every time you drink this blood or this cup, remind yourself of the blood that Jesus shed for you. Let's take the cup. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made, and we know that you did not have to do it. You chose to do it, and for that, we are forever grateful. We're grateful because of the decision that you chose to make. We now have freedom. We now have healing. We now have deliverance. We now have power. We now have authority. And we're now seated with you in heavenly places. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen, amen. Listen, thank you so much for coming. I didn't say this, but if you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to text saved to the number that you see on the screen or the number that you all see in the chat. And if you need prayer, we've got some amazing uh, prayer warriors down here on the front row that want to pray for you. Come on and let us connect with you in faith. Otherwise, I love you. I'll see you next week. God bless.